You know, whenever we sing praise and worship, and we get up and we involve ourselves in that section of the service, you're beginning to create an atmosphere. And not only are you changing the atmosphere, but you're beginning to deal with this one right here. And you're causing this flesh to let it know that what I'm here for today is to honor the king. And I found that we can enter into praise and worship and we really feel his presence. But then when it comes to the time of the giving of the word, it's like the atmosphere changes. And this flesh starts to act back up again. And yet, what I believe he's trying to teach us is that you've asked him to come. You say the words, Baruch Kaba, blessed is he who comes. And we know that he answers. He hears that and he's shown up. And we find that when the giving of the word begins to take place, his word is who he is. It's a facet of his character. And so when his word's being spoken forth, it's no different than if he was physically walking here in the house. He's answering your call. You said Baruch Kaba. Blessed is he who comes. You invited him. You asked him to come. You're here. You're gathered for one purpose, for the king to show up. Now, let me ask you a question. If the king was here walking among us, how many would go to sleep? How many would be worried about what time it is and what we're going to do when we leave here? How many would be worried about, well, you know, i got to go to the bathroom, go get something to drink, I've got some other things to do. Would we act that way if the king was here? No. Then why do we act that way when his words are being spoken? And we find that that's what this Torah portion is all about. This Torah portion is one of the greatest lessons that Israel ever failed to learn, and yet we're being given an opportunity to learn it now. How we handle the Torah, how we handle his word is how we're going to handle him. And if we haven't handled the Torah, his word that he's giving us now correctly, then we're not going to handle the king correctly. We're not going to handle the ark in the proper manner. And how many of you realize that when you mishandle his presence, when you mishandle the ark, there was dire consequences because they knew better. They had been taught. And so we find that as we begin to look at this Torah portion, there's some very powerful lessons that he's trying to teach us because I've got news for you. You're the generation. There's an inheritance and there's giants in the land. The enemy has set up camp and he's setting up his own kingdom in what's supposed to be your inheritance. And unless we become a generation that's like Joshua and like Caleb that's able to go in and say, no, we've got this, because the one that's for us is more than anything that can be against us, then the enemy is going to remain in the camp, having set up until the generation rises up. The title of this week's Torah portion is Shalak Laka. Can you say that with me? Shalak Laka. It's translated as sin for yourself. It's interesting. It's a command. It's not a question. It's not a suggestion. It's not if you feel like it, do this. It's no. Sin for yourself. It covers Numbers chapter 13, verse 1, through chapter 15, verse 41. And as was already alluded to earlier, it's really one of the lowest points on the Exodus journey. Because it's when the spies bring back an evil report. And we find that when the spies bring back, ten of them bring back this evil report... The whole camp of Israel accepts it. And as David's already alluded to, it changes the fate of an entire nation. They've been given the Torah. Yahweh has led them, guided them, directed them, met all their needs in the wilderness, and now it's time to step out and do what they're called to do. The very reason he brought them out of bondage. Do you realize that you and I today, he's brought you out of bondage for a reason? He didn't bring you out just because. He didn't bring you out and clean you up and have you sit on a shelf. But there's a reason. He's preparing his people for something, and it has to do exactly with this Torah portion he's dealing with. And we find that after the children of Israel accept this bad report, the declaration is then made they're going to wander for 40 years. And that's a long time. In fact, as they wander for this 40 years, it's not just that they have to be delayed and, oh, 40 years from now you get to go in. But instead, the entire generation that refused to enter in then is killed off in the wilderness. And their children will be raised up to enter in because they weren't willing to do what Yahweh told them to do. And it was interesting to me because as I'm reading this now, remember, if you've been reading these four portions along, ever since Israel has left Egypt, their response has been the same. So it's really not a surprise, it seems, that they would respond this way. Ever since they've left Egypt, what have they done? They've murmured. They've complained. they voiced their need and their want to go back to Egypt. They've been disobedient. They built a golden calf at Mount Sinai. And so it doesn't seem as much as a surprise. And yet all of these other times, Yahweh's 
forgiven them. There's something that's taken place. Atonement was made, and Israel moves on. And yet, this one's a little different. His response is different on this occasion. And so, you have to ask the question, is this just the straw that broke the camel's back? Had he finally had enough, and then it makes you wonder, when's that straw for us? Or was there something else? Was there something about what they were supposed to do, what they had been charged with when they went into the land, and because of their answer, that that's why he responds the way he does? Because something that took place on this expedition. It was important to note to me and interesting that the sages teach that it was the ninth of Av when Israel accepted the evil report. And many of you know the ninth of Av throughout history has been associated with times of disaster and destruction, including and not limited to the destruction of the first and second temples and even events all the way up into modern history. But it all starts and branches right back to this evil report that was brought back from the land. And so with that in mind, you see that there's these ripple effects that begin to happen. So what was so significant? What did these spies do that causes this day to stand in infamy throughout history as a time of destruction, disaster? It all goes back to this evil report that was planted in Israel. We're going to look at this and we're going to see what is expected of us. Because once again, you're going to go shalak bakah. You're going to sin for yourself. And so if you'll turn with me to Numbers chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, we're going to look at some of these verses right here that open up this portion. And in the English it says, And Yahweh spake unto Moshe, saying, Send now men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moshe, by the commandment of Yahweh, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. It's interesting because these weren't babies. They weren't newbies. They were princes. They were the leaders. They were the ones that were expected to be the ones shouldering the responsibility for the camp of Israel. In other words, they were the ones that were supposed to know better, know how to handle the word, know how to accomplish and do what Yahweh's called them to do. He sends the princes of the tribes of Israel. But we're going to look at this, and we're going to begin to break it down in the Hebrew because you will never see in the English what's taking place and what the magnitude of this journey is until you look at it in the Hebrew language. The phrase shalak laka, before we begin to really break it down, I wanted to focus on that second part, laka. It's translated in English as for yourself, but whenever you see this, it actually is insinuating that it's for your own good. It's for your best interest. It's for your benefit that you do this. Whatever this word's being attached to, he's letting you know that whatever command he's sticking this on, that's for your best interest. That's for your own good that you do that. And so as we begin to look at this, we have to ask the question, is what's for our own good? What's for our best interest that we accomplish whatever command he's giving us? Because we find that this is the mindset that Israel's entering into this journey with. So we're going to look at this word for sin. Shalak. Sin for yourself. In Hebrew, it's Strong's number 7971. And it can mean to send away, to let go, to stretch out or cast out. It can mean to be divorced or to let loose. And you'll find this word has a broad range of meaning. But there's several of these nuances that go along with this word that really help to unveil exactly what command Israel's being given here. This word shalak can be used to describe how one would send a messenger to inform someone. It can mean to send words to another and to command anything to anyone. So when we see this terminology being used concerning the spies, he's literally telling them, go for your best benefit, go because it's for your own good, and I want you to send a message. You're being sent as a messenger. You're being sent to convey some information. Well, to who? To the inhabitants of the land. It can also refer to stretch out as a finger or the rod. A lot of children know what this means. If you get the finger, you know trouble, the rod's coming later. It can mean to stretch out a finger or to stretch out the rod. And it seems as if when he's using this terminology to describe the, the spies being sent, it's as if the spies now are representing him and they become the finger of Yahweh. And they're being sent into the land to point at the giants and the inhabitants to let them know judgment's coming. The rod's about to descend in the house. That's the message they're supposed to send. Amen? I mean, you all have a message. 
Wouldn't it be nice to send a message to the own giants in your own lives? Yes. It's time right. to go. Right. Well, it's quite funny because, to be honest, a lot of times we do the direct opposite, don't we? Yes. Shh. Don't talk about that. <laughs> Shh. Don't make them mad. Yeah. Don't rock the boat. Don't let them know. Yeah. Just creep around. Let them be. Let them be situated. Don't aggravate them. Don't annoy them. Don't call attention because you're going to make the enemy mad. And yet we find that this is the direct opposite of what he's telling you to do. He's telling you that you're supposed to be the messenger. You're supposed to stick your finger and let them know judgment's coming to the house. And yet, whenever we begin to talk about judgment, what does the scriptures tell us? Where does judgment begin? It begins in his own house. So this becomes the understanding that Israel is being conveyed. This message they're being given before they ever go into the land is that I'm sending you to declare judgment in the land. But the moment you decide to declare that and you become that messenger, you now are declaring judgment right here as well because he's a just Elohim. How can he judge the inhabitants of the land without judging his own first? And now you know why we like to stay quiet a lot. You can keep your sin and I'll keep mine. And no one's got to point fingers at each other and we all get along fine. And yet we find this Torah portion is letting you know what Yahweh intends to do. He intends to shake it all up. He's going to judge the house. And so we find that as they're being sent as these messengers, they understand that as we go, as we go to utter this commandment, as we go to speak forth this message from the Creator to the inhabitants of the land, that they also are now having to inspect themselves. They're having to do that inspection. See, is there anything within us that's going to hinder this? Is there anything in us that's going to cause us to be judged unrighteous as well? And as we continue to look at this, it was interesting to me that the gematria, or the numerical value of this phrase, shalak laka, equals 388. And there's some that would say, well, the numbers, they don't mean anything. That's, that's made up. That's something that doesn't even go along with the scriptures. And I would say that just because you may not understand something doesn't mean that Yahweh's infinite knowledge is not more than ours. Yeah. And when he places these things here, it's not by accident. There's a reason. He's coded himself. This is his word. This is who he is. And he's a lot bigger than we think. Yeah. The value 388 is the same value as the Hebrew word katsar. It's strong number 2690. And it's interesting because just in case you were thinking that maybe that's not why they had to go in the land, that maybe they were just going to go furtively, spy about, not really send a message. They were just sneaking in and sneaking out. The word katsar means to blow a trumpet, to sound an alarm. And we understand in Numbers chapter 10, he tells you about these trumpets. They were blown to declare war. This is why they're being sent. Right. He's sounding the alarm. He's declaring war on the inhabitants that have set up and usurped his land. In Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, it says, And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall be saved from your enemies. Right. And so we find that if they're willing to go and to blow and sound the alarm, it's going to be a twofold purpose. Not only is it going to send a message to the enemies in the land, but it's also going to cause Yahweh to pay attention now. As they blow the alarm, he hears it, and they're remembered, and now they're saved. And so it's just as Chad was saying earlier, it's not about who you are, but it's about being willing, and then he shows up. And so we find that when they make this declaration, it's for their own good, because if they don't make the declaration, then how can they be remembered? How can they be saved? They've got to sound the alarm. If you continue to look at this 388 numerical value of Shalak Laka, it was also has another word that's quite interesting, and it's the word kafash which also has this value. And it means to be free or to be freed. And it's a term when you begin to look at the roots of this word and how it's used in the scriptures, it's a term that deals with a legal discussion regarding an ex-slave and what exactly their rights are. Now that's interesting because Israel were slaves in Egypt. The inhabitants of the land know that. And most of the time, let's be honest, the enemy usually knows the covenant terms and how it works better than we do. He knows the rules. He knows the boundary lines. He knows what rights he has and what rights he doesn't have. It's our problem when we don't know, and therefore he runs over us. And so as they're preparing to go in the land and to send this message, a legal discussion is about to happen. We find that what's being questioned is, wait a minute, do they even have the right to give us an eviction notice? Do these ex-slaves 
have the authority and the power to tell us to go, to declare war on us and our habitation. It's, uh, it's interesting because that term shalak, the name of this portion, it has another meaning, and it means to release from slavery or to set free, to free a slave. So at the same time he's beginning to connect all this, you were slaves in Egypt, but now you've been set free. You're shalot. You've been let go. You're set free from your bondage. And as they prepare to enter into the land and declare war on the inhabitants, the question arises, do they have the right? Are they able to? It's a valid question because we find that the meaning behind this is if Israel is still in bondage themselves, even though Yahweh set them free, if they haven't let it go yet, if they haven't released those, laid the burdens down, if they're still holding on to the mentality of a slave, if they're still holding on to everything that would keep them in bondage and enslaved, then how can they go in and free the land? You can't. If you're not free, how can you free someone else? If you don't have the own power to help yourself, how can you help someone else? It's like an alcoholic trying to go into a bar and help the rest of them get out of it. You can't. You're in the same boat. And so we find that it becomes this valid question because what right does Israel have to tell the enemy to go if they're not willing to deal with their own flesh and make the changes necessary to walk in the freedom that's been offered to them? And we find that it becomes a valid question for you and I today as well because you're being tasked with the same thing. You're being tasked with preparing and building and making way for the kingdom of Yahweh. And that means dealing with the enemy. Yet how can we tell the enemy to go and to free our inheritance, to free the gates? How can we control the gates if we're not willing to deal with this one first? So before Israel ever goes in, they're being reminded the giants in the land aren't going to be the issue. The issue is going to be this one right here. Are you willing to deal with this one? And if you're willing to deal with this one, then Yahweh's going to show up anyway and deal with the rest. Amen. Amen. If you continue to look at this word kafash, which means to free a slave, it's a cognate of the word kafas. The only difference is the dot on the machine. It means to search for, to search out something that's valuable, but it can also mean to disguise oneself or to let oneself be searched out. And when the Hebrew language, when you have these words, they're beginning to paint a picture and they all go off of one another and they all help describe the meaning. And it seems in that what he's trying to reveal to us is the way you're going to be free, the way that your rights are going to be restored, you're going to be victorious in this, it has to do with this word kafas. It has to do with searching out something that's valuable. Searching out one that's been disguised and hidden, but is now allowing himself to be found. So it seems then that the answer to the question of whether Israel has been set free or not the answer to the question of whether we've been set free or not has to do and depend upon our willingness to search out something, the one that's been disguised, the one that's been hidden and is now allowing us to seek him. And we find that as we seek him and we're willing to search out the one that's been hidden, in turn it's showing a willingness on our part as well for our own hearts to be searched. And so as they prepare to go into the land, he's letting them know, you're being sent into the land to search for the one that's disguised himself. You're being sent in the land to diligently seek someone. And as you diligently seek him, it's going to cause your own heart to be searched. So anything that you've stored up in here, anything that may be hidden that you think I don't see, your own hearts are going to be searched as you search the land. You know, it's no accident that they're told to go and search the land. But in the Hebrew, there's a clue as to the one that's disguised himself. There's a clue here that it's not just about the physical land. Yahweh knows what it looks like. Yahweh knows who's there. But what are they sent to look for? We find that in the Hebrew, the phrase here, search the land, is Vayatru et Eretz. Olive Tav Eretz. We understand in the book of Revelation, Yeshua makes a statement. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And in the Hebrew, it would be rendered the Aleph and Tav. So when Israel is told to go into the land, the declaration that they're given is go and search for the Aleph Tav. Go and seek out the Messiah, the one that's disguised himself and is hidden. And if you're willing to search him out, if you're willing to diligently seek him, 
then that's proof and evidence that you're free from your bondage. We find that they're being sent to search out the olive top, the Messiah who has disguised himself and is allowing them now to seek him out. And we find that if they'll be obedient to do this, this is now becoming the proof that there's been a change in the heart of Israel. It's interesting because in Psalm 63, there's a whole chapter that talks about seeking him early in the morning. And the next statement says that my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land. It's dealing that if you're going to seek him out, it's meaning, it's showing, and it's evidence that there's been a heart change. It's not just a casual glance. It's not a casual once a week showing up and saying, hey, Instead, it's dealing with someone that would diligently search for him. It's dealing with someone that their desire is to find him. They can't rest. They can't sleep. They can't eat. They can't do anything else until they find him. That this is the type of searching they're doing. Their focus is solely directed on him. And we find that when they go into the land, that's what he expects. Is your focus solely directed on seeking me out as you walk into the land? Or are you concerned with other things? And we find that if they're solely concerned with him, then they would be indicated, would be yeah. the evidence. This is a free people. Yeah. Their yeah. hearts have been changed. Their mindset's oh. changed. They're no longer a slave. They're no longer in bondage. Yeah. John 8.36 says it this way. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Yeah. And now they are the enemy to tell us otherwise. Amen? Amen? Let's look at the word for search. Search the land. It's Strong's number 8446. It's the word tour. It's kind of interesting because the English word tour, if you take a tour through the land. In Hebrew, it means to seek out, to search, to spy out, or explore. But it can refer to lead someone about, to show them the way in which they should walk. And it's usually meaning that you're being directed on the right path, the path of righteousness. He's teaching you how to walk this out. And so we find with, when you see this phrase in the Hebrew, the et tour, to search out the olive top, it's literally indicating that as you go into the land, you're going to learn how to walk with the olive top. You're going to learn how to walk with the Messiah. And it's taking them all the way back to the Garden of Eden when he walked with them in the cool of the day, a relationship they hadn't seen since then. But when they go into the land, he's letting them know, I'm going to walk with you when you enter the land, if you're willing to seek me. It's interesting because the three-letter root of this word, tor, is tav, vav, resh. But if you add the hey on the end, it spells the word Torah. So it could have just as easily have said, search the land, search the Torah, search the Torah for the all of tav. It's all one and the same. Because the Torah were the instructions given that teach us how to walk with them. And so we find that as they're preparing to go in the land, remember all this time previous, what has he been doing? Ever since they've left Egypt, all the way until they get here to this location where the spies are being sent in, what has been his mode of operation with Israel? He's been teaching them the Torah. They camped at Sinai for an entire year to learn the Torah, to be taught, to know it. And we find now that what he's revealing to them is that as they go into the land, the Torah that you've been taught is going to show you and teach you how to find me. The Torah is going to teach you how to walk with me. In other words, when you go into the land and you're surrounded by your enemies and the giants are in the land and your faith is going to waver, if you put the Torah in, then you'll know how to find me. Yeah. You'll know how to seek me. You'll know that I'm walking with you. How many of you know how to find them in the midst of the storm? Do you realize that it has everything to do with putting this in? It's interesting when you are in the ministry, you hear from a lot of people when things go bad. You may not hear from them any other time, but when things go bad, they start calling. Why? Because they didn't put it in, but they know someone else did, and they know it works. And so we find that this is what he's trying to reveal to Israel. Put the Torah in, and when you go into the land, you'll know how to find me. You'll know how to seek, search me out, and I'll be with you, and you'll walk with me through the midst of the valley. If we look at this word tor, the first reference is Numbers chapter 10, verse 33. In fact, here in this tor portion is only the second time it's seen and used. The first one is here in Numbers 10, 33. It says, And the ark of the covenant of Yahweh went before them in three days' journey to search, to tour out a resting place for them. And I thought that was interesting because here it's the ark. It's Yahweh himself that is doing the seeking, the searching looking for a resting place for the children of Israel to follow. 
But here in this Torah portion, it's the children of Israel that must tour. Yeah. They must seek. They must search. And could it be that they're now searching for a resting place for Yahweh? He seeks for a resting place for them, and now it's their turn to search for a resting place for his presence. So we find there's a change in what's taking place here. And it's interesting because it seems that the focus here is on the ark, but as they enter the land, the entire focus is on this one right here, making sure this vessel's ready, making sure this vessel is willing to seek him out. And it seems to be inferring that this is going to be the resting place for his presence. And as they enter into the promised land and they're searching it out and they're looking for a resting place for him, it's actually dealing with him searching their hearts to see if this is a proper resting place for him. Because when they enter the land, they're going to be being put into a squeezing process. They're going to be being put into the press and it's going to reveal and cause to come up anything that's been planted in there. And as that begins to come up, it's going to show and draw a line in the sand. That one's a proper resting place for my presence. That one's not. Wow. And now you can see why Joshua and Caleb bring back the report they do compared to the two yes. spies. Yeah. They were a proper resting place for the presence yeah. of Yahweh. The word resting place is manuka. It means a resting place or rest. But its roots can infer that where Yahweh would place his name and dwell is the resting place. And so we find that if they, search, if they search and seek out the Isle of Tav, and they've prepared a place for him in their hearts, they've made themselves ready to be presented before him, then the promise that he's giving them is that I'm going to place my name upon the children of Israel. You'll be my manuka. You'll be my resting place. Amen? Do you realize if you're the resting place for Yahweh, that all the inhabitants of the land have already seen what happens when the presence comes up from the ark. And he goes forth and he vanquishes the enemy. And no one can stand before him. And then he comes and rests among the children of Israel. So this becomes the imagery that he's showing them. That as they go into the land, they're now the ark. They're now the resting place. His presence is being housed in them. And so when they go and they face the enemy, it's the presence that's in them. It's Yahweh himself that's going to defeat the enemies of the land. They just have to make sure they're a proper vessel. Manuka, if you continue to look, it has the same three-letter root as another word in Hebrew. It's manon. They both have the mem, nun, vav root. And it means progeny. But it was interesting because it refers to a slave who has become a son through his master's careful nurture and care. This is all about Israel coming out of Egypt. They were slaves, but now there has to be a change. There has to be a status change. And we find that if they're going to take back the land, they can't take it back as slaves. If that's the identity they're wearing, then they're not going to be successful. They have no right to that inheritance. And yet, through this process of them becoming a resting place, it has to do with the fact that he's taken a slave and the master cares for them, nurtures them, just like he's doing at Sinai, all the way leading up to this point on the Exodus, and now they're a son. Now, Manuka. Now he places his name upon them. You realize that when you place your name upon someone, such as in marriage or your children, they represent you? That name carries the weight of who you are, your authority, your power. So when he says he's going to put his name upon the children of Israel, he's letting them know, I'm placing my power and my authority oh, in you so you can go into the land and you can tell them to get out. Yeah. You can be the finger. Yeah. Move. Now we can understand why the sending forth deals with the slave being set free because it's through this process. It's this process of going into the land, being obedient, sending the message, this transition is taking place. They may still have some of the garments of slavery on, but as they go in, these get taken away and his name now gets placed on them. And now they can stand up boldly and say, they're a son. Yeah. It's interesting because in the New Testament we're told that the creation groans waiting for the manifestation of the sons of Elohim. And it's not talking about the babies. It's talking about the mature sons and daughters that are able to take care of his business. And this is the same picture of what's going on here. The land is groaning, waiting to be set free from the bondage it's been enduring. But it's going to take the mature sons and daughters of Israel to set it free. Yes, yes, yes. And so we find that to fail to deal with our own hearts, 
do not have his name resting upon us, it's going to affect the message we send to the inhabitants of the land. Because if you don't have his name resting upon you, then you're not able to deliver this message in the authority and the power that it's supposed to be. And let me tell you, the enemy is going to be able to tell the difference. He's going to know if you're saying it in your own will or if you're saying it because that's a direct word from Yahweh. Now, it's no coincidence that the term for men here, it says, send now men, is the word Enosh. There's several words that could have been used, but instead he uses this one. Which is interesting. It's translated as meaning man or mortal man, but it's from the root anash, which means to be weak, sick, frail. It describes the incurably wicked and desperately sick condition of the human heart in Jeremiah. It's a term that's connected with sin and iniquity throughout almost all of its uses. And so when we see this phrase, sin now men, remember the word sin can also mean to divest, to let go, to divorce something. And so they find that as they're being told this, they're being prepared to enter into the land. He's letting them know before they ever go, you need to deal with the condition of your heart. You need to remove, let go of anything that would cause it to be wicked or sick or frail. Any sin that's in the camp that you've allowed to begin to fester, it needs to be dealt with. It has to be let go of. You must divorce yourself from that or else you're not going to be a fit manuka a fit resting place for his presence. And then it goes on and he begins to tell, he picks, hand picks the men that are going to be sent into the promised land. We understand that in Hebrew, every single name has a prophetical declaration. So these names aren't just listed to fill up space. Well, I wanted chapter 13 to be 16, however many verses long. So let's fill it up by putting a bunch of names. These names are significant. They mean something. But today we're not going to look at the names themselves but the names of the tribes. Because the very next thing he goes into is the names of the tribes and the spy from each tribe that will go in. Did any of you notice the peculiar order that these tribes are listed? I had to go back and look. It's not listed in their birth order. It's not listed in the order of their mothers of who they were born from like we see before. It's not listed in the order that they are blessed. It's not listed in the order that they are counted. It's not listed in the order that they count. It's a unique order to the listing of these names. And it presents a very unique message from the meaning of the names that deals specifically with this encounter. They're listed in the order of Reuben, Reuben, Simeon, Judah, Issachar, Ephraim, Benjamin, Zebulon, Joseph, Manasseh. He parenthetically inserts Joseph's name. He doesn't do it with Ephraim, but he does it with Manasseh. Joseph, the tribe of Joseph, that is Manasseh. Dan, Asher, Naphtali, and Gad. If you look at the meanings of their names, Reuben means behold the son. Simeon heard. Judah means praised. Issachar means there is recompense. Ephraim means either a double ash heap or doubly fruitful either a blessing or a curse, and double of it. Benjamin means son of the right hand. Zebulon means an exalted dwelling place, which is exactly what the promised land was. It's where they would dwell with their groom. Joseph, inserted as a parenthetical statement, means to add or to repeat. Manasseh means to forget. Dan means to judge. Asher deals with one that is upright. It's a similar root to Israel, Yashar El. One that would walk upright. Naphtali means wrestling, and Gad can mean a troop, and it deals with battle and warfare, but it can also mean fortune. And Gad's an interesting name because the roots of his name deal with a painful cutting that one would go through with the purpose of laying a treasure bare. In other words, it's about going through the pain and the effort to reach something that's priceless. That's what Gad's name means. So if you put these names together, this was the declaration that was being spoken over Israel as they prepare to go into the land. Behold the son who hears and is to be praised. He will give recompense causing you to be doubly fruitful or an ash heap. In other words, he'll either dole out to you a blessing or a curse depending on how you approach the son of the right hands exalted dwelling place. 
In other words, behold the olive top, behold the sun, the Messiah. He hears. He's to be praised. You're approaching his dwelling place. This land is his. How you come and handle it, how you behave yourself when you come into his house is going to determine whether you get a blessing or a curse. It's interesting because the focus isn't on the enemy at all. Instead, the focus is on how they handle him. Then we have Joseph's name, parenthetically almost, and it reminding us that this is going to be repeated. It's going to happen again. In other words, he's letting you know, don't look back and scoff at them at what they did because you're going to get your opportunity too. It's going to happen again. And then the rest of the statement goes on that though we have been forgotten, Manasseh, during the coming judgments, if we walk upright and wrestle, and I believe it's literally important that if we'll circumcise our hearts to lay the treasure bare, in other words, if we'll go through the painful process of seeking out the one who has hidden himself, the olive top, then you'll receive your fortune. Then you'll receive your inheritance. Amen. In other words, before the spies ever entered the land, the message was being made clear of who their focus was to be on. They were not to be concerned with the giants in the land and what the enemy had done, but their focus first and foremost was to be on the son of the right hand. That's who they were going to search. That's who they were going to seek out. And we find that only by dealing with and circumcising their own hearts would they be able to gain access to this inheritance that he's had waiting for them. 430 years, it's been here, it's waiting, and now if you're willing to deal with your hearts, you can gain access to it. But we find that the warning is there that if you attempt to approach his house, if you attempt to approach his land with the heart that's not right, with one that hasn't went through that circumcising of their flesh, then it's going to cause them to be judged as well. And we find that Joseph's name acts as a sign reminding us that this is still true today. And it's not just dealing with the physical land of Israel. It's dealing with the presence and who he is. When you approach him, handle him with care. When his presence is moving and you're in his house and you're worshiping him or you're listening to his voice, he's reminding you that the king is here and he deserves all the respect that he is due. And depending on how we handle him, that then determines what happens afterwards whether we're doubly fruitful or become a double ash heap. And we find that it's those that are willing to walk upright, to walk this out, they're going to be the ones that are going to receive their inheritance in the days ahead. Those that walk upright and seek him are going to be victorious in the days ahead. And yet we find, after all this, Israel goes, they're gone for 40 days and they come back. And ten spies bring back an evil report on the land. And it causes us to ask the question, what happened? Yahweh's been with them through everything. Ever since they've left Egypt, he's performed miracle after miracle. And even then they go into the land and they make it out, all right. They're not eaten. They're not destroyed. They're not killed on this expedition. They make it back. They're successful. But yet they bring back an evil report what took place. And if you go to Numbers chapter 13, verse 23, we're given some details about what they do in the land. And in verse 23, it deals with them going into the land and collecting some of the fruit of the land. And I told David I was going to do my best not to get in his book with the store portion. It says in verse 23, it says, And they came into the brook of Eshcol, and they cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And then it goes on to, This place was called the Brook of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from there. And that they returned from searching the land after 40 days. Now it's interesting to me, here in the scriptures, it looks as if it takes two men to carry the grapes. But in the Midrash, they go into a little more detail and they say that it took eight men to carry the grapes, one man to carry the pomegranate, and one man to carry the fig. And when I saw that with my lightning quick mind and math, I thought, my goodness, that's ten people. Ten spies bring back a bad report. Ten people, according to the Midrash, carrying the fruit. Do you think maybe there's a connection? 
Do you think that maybe these ten were messing with someone that they had no business messing with and because they hadn't dealt with their own hearts and their own issues they had in their own lives that when they went into the enemy's camp and started messing with his stuff, they themselves became compromised instead? It becomes an important object lesson for you and I today. You can't rebuke the enemy when you're the one constantly opening the door and inviting him in. It really doesn't make sense. <coughs> it's also important to note that this expedition took 40 days, as we're told here. 40 is the number of weeks of gestation until birth. It also represents the men in Hebrew. It has a numerical value of 40. And men is a picture of the womb. So when we see this 40 days, this number is significant. These 40 days are a birthing process. It's about what's been planted in the womb of these spies. They go for 40 days, and it's this gestational cycle. It's growing, and now it's about to be revealed about whatever it is they had planted in here. And isn't it interesting that it's their words that reveal what was planted? Because from the heart, the mouth speaks. And so when these spies come back, it's revealing this is the seed that was planted in them. Whatever comes forth out of their mouth, it's now birthing what it was they entertained, what it was they let in. Now let's look at the word for branch. It says that they cut down a branch, which is interesting because the word cut, by the way, can also mean to cut a covenant. It's karat. It doesn't just mean to saw off, hack off a branch, but it's a word that's also used to cut a covenant. So when you see this terminology, it's letting you know something's taking place here. A covenant's being entered into. But this is dealing with the fruit of the serpent. This is dealing with the fruit of the giants in the land. Now let's look at the word for branch. They cut down a branch. The word branch is zamora, and it means branch. But it's another interesting word because there are several terms that can be used to mean a branch. This one is specifically used to refer to a branch that was used in pagan occult practices. It's used only in five verses. The first one is here in Numbers chapter 13. The next one is in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 10. It says, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, Yehoshua, Yeshua, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants and shall set it with strange slips. You'll plant Zamora. You'll plant strange branches, a strange seed, a strange fruit, because you forgot the olive top. Wow. Because you forgot the God of your salvation, the rock that's been following you, the one that you're supposed to be seeking while you're in the promised land. And because of that, another seed gets in. You plant something else. The word forgotten is shakah there in Isaiah, and it means to forget or to ignore, but it can also mean to wither. It's interesting because the terminology that the Hebrew begins to present is that the ten spies have allowed the seed, the word of the God of their salvation, to wither. They didn't watch over it. They didn't make sure it was planted in good ground and that it was producing a fruit. Instead, they made room. They planted a strange seed, GMO. They planted a strange stock. It was something that was modified and had no business being in the camp of Israel. And we find this 40-day process is causing what's inside them to be, to be birthed and to be revealed. Do you realize that the same thing can be said of you and I? When the word of Yahweh goes forth, it's seed. And if you let that seed wither and you don't do anything with it, there's another one that's going to come along. And he's going to show you all this fruit and all these good things. And he's going to let you know, just come away. Just come over here. Get off the path, just like Eve. And you'll have entertained the serpent. And the house will be compromised because you let the word wither. We abandoned the God of our salvation. Now let's look at the word for Eshkol. They're at the brook of Eshkol where they enter into this covenant cutting process where they accept this seed. They plant this strange stock. The word eshkol in Hebrew is strong number 812, and it means a cluster, but it's from the root eshek, which means the stones of a man, the place of seed. In other words, it's letting you know there's no doubt about what's taking place here. This is dealing with the seed of the serpent. Israel's been sent in to cut off the fruit of that, the Nephilim, the fallen ones, the giants that are in the land, and they've now come to this location which
which is symbolic of the place where the seed is housed. They're at Esh Kol. Deal with it. Cut it off. But what do they do? They plant something. Instead, they Zamora, they take that and they forget the God of their salvation. It's interesting because this word Esh Kol has a three-letter root of the Sheen, Kaf, Lamed. It's a call. Strong number 7919, it means to be prudent, to be wise, to act with insight. And it can be used in a negative term or a positive term. They should have been prudent. They should have acted with insight in how they dealt with the seed of the servant and how they dealt with the enemy so they didn't find themselves compromised. But this same word is used in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And it describes the tree of knowledge of good and evil that would make one wise to call the same word. I mean, so we find it's a reference to when the serpent first compromised the house because he found someone that was li willing to listen to the words, willing to allow the seed to be planted. And from that point on, they would no longer walk in the cool of the day with the olive the top because they had forgotten the God of their salvation. And now we find that Israel, they're here. They're at the same, it's the same pic pictograph that's taking place. They're at the place where they can deal, they can cut off the seed of the serpent. They can deal with the one that would try to compromise the house. And they're supposed to cut it off. And yet, there's something else that's happening. Once again, they're entertaining. Once again, they're listening. Once again, they're allowing something to get in the house that's going to compromise it. If you look a little further, this same root, Shin Kaf Lamed, spells the word Shakol. It means to make childless, to miscarry to be deprived of children, to be barren or unfruitful, to abort. This is all about the battle between the seed lines of this location. Israel is being sent to the land to cut off the giants, the seed line of the serpents that's compromised the land. And at this location of Eshkol, they're supposed to cut off the place of the seed. And if they would have done that, it would have made the enemy unfruitful, barren. It was a symbolic act. They were sending the message, no more. It ends now. Yet we find that ten of them have roots of the same fruit in their own life. They didn't deal with their own hearts. They didn't deal with the bondage in their own life. So when they go in and they begin to mess with the enemy's camp, they themselves become compromised. And we find that what happens is instead of aborting the seed of the enemy, cutting it off, dealing with it, it instead aborts the word of Yahweh wow. in their own life. Yeah. And when they come back, the declaration of their mouth changes. Yeah. The land will eat you. There's giants in the land. We can't take it. It's going to be a disaster. And we find that only Joshua and Caleb come back with the report that their covering is gone. We can do this. They're bred for us. We can take the land. Why? Because they understood we're being sent to cut that off. And we're going to cut it off. And that way the word of Yahweh is going to continue to flourish in our own lives. But the moment we allow that weed seed to get in, it's going to compromise the house. And that's exactly what it does. In verse 32, we're told they brought up an evil report concerning the olive tav Uretz, concerning the olive tav land. They brought up an evil report concerning the Messiah who they were sent to search and to seek out. Evil report is Strong's number 1681, Diba. And it means a whispering, a defamation, an evil report, slander. Do you realize that the same idea carries along when we whisper things as well, when we slander one another, when there's rumors that go around circulating, which is one thing that the body has been quite guilty of? We become guilty of the same thing. We're spreading the evil report. And it continually cuts off the word of Yahweh every time we spread it. And then we wonder why there's issues in the house. If you break down this word diva, it's spelled dalet bait hay. The dalet represents a door. The bait hay forms the word in Hebrew, in her. In other words, when they brought the evil report, when they brought the diva, the picture is that they opened a door in her. Who's it talking about? The bride. They opened a door in the bride for a compromising seed to be planted. And so we find they do the direct opposite of what they were charged with doing. They were supposed to cut off the compromising seed, and yet instead they bring it back and they plant it in the camp by the words of their mouth. They open the door in her. And it causes us to ask the question, painful as it may be, how often are our own words guilty of the same thing? 
How often do our own words declare an evil report, planting that bad seed in our own household and cutting off the word of Yahweh and what he's trying to do in our lives. And it's because we're not dealing with this right here. Now, what's the people's response, though? You realize that they didn't have to accept it. It may have ended a whole lot differently if they had dealt with their own hearts as well. If they would have listened to Joshua and Caleb. Instead, we find in Numbers chapter 14, verse 3, it says, And wherefore hath Yahweh brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? The word prey here in Hebrew is Strong's number 957. It's Baz. And it means a spoil a robbery. But here, it's interesting because it's written with the Lamed prefix, Labaz. Lamed Beit Zion. Lamed Beit means heart. The Zion represents a weapon or a sword. It means to cut. So it could literally be forming the question that not only are they asking, did he bring us out here to be a prey, but on the other end of the spectrum, did he bring us out here to cut our heart, to circumcise our hearts? Did he really bring us out here so that we would have to deal with our flesh? That we'd have to circumcise our hearts? you got to be kidding me. It'd be better to go back to Egypt than to have to deal with that. That's painful. That's that painful cutting the name Gad talks about to reveal a treasure. The seeking out that they're being called to do. A cognate of this word Baz is Baza, Strong's number 959. It means to despise, to hold in contempt, to disdain. It describes one who despises their birthright. Doesn't that sound a lot like Esau? Esau despised his birthright because of that he's cut off. And here we have Israel guilty of the same thing. They despise their birthright. And notice that Baz, pray, bait Zion. The bait represents a house. The Zion means to cut. Because they despise their birthright, they would be a house cut off by the sword because they despise their inheritance. They literally despise the Debar, the word of Yahweh. They weren't willing to search out the Aleph Tav, the Et, the Messiah. Because of that, their house is now going to be cut off. And a new generation is going to have to be raised up that maybe is going to treat that inheritance, that birthright, that Aleph and Tav, with the respect that they're supposed to. And after we read this, it's really interesting because when you get to chapter 15, 13 and 14 is all about this searching out of the land and the evil report that's brought back. But then you get to 15, it almost seems that there's a disconnect. What are we reading? Because all of a sudden he begins to talk about offerings again. And he makes no mention of the previous segment of what just took place. But he begins to talk about the meat or the meal offering and the drink offering that was required to be brought with the sacrifices when they go into the land. And so it seems as if there's a complete disconnect. And what does this have to do with this evil report? What does this have to do with what has just taken place in the camp? There's a death sentence that's just been uttered. And they know Yahweh's good for his word. They're all fixing to get cut off in the next 40 years. So what do they care about this idea of an offering that's supposed to be brought up? Come on. Well, it's interesting because when you get to the final steps of a a covenant cutting process, it was to share a meal together. That's why we have Oneg. It's literally the idea that a covenant's been cut and now we share a meal to seal that covenant. In fact, the word for covenant in Hebrew is brit, and it comes from roots meaning to eat, to share food. It hints at an ongoing relationship. If we share food together, if we break bread together, we're in good terms. We have a covenant relationship, and it's ongoing, never ending. So the question becomes, could it be then that he's reminding us that the covenant is still in effect? There's still a chance to salvage this relationship because he directly begins to talk about the offerings that would seal the covenant. And he reminds us that this covenant is ongoing. It is forever with the house of Abraham. And so it almost seems that he's letting them know, yes, you're going to have to be cut off for the consequences of your sin, But that doesn't mean this relationship has to end. And you can begin to raise up your children. They're going to go in and they're going to take the land. You can make teshuvah. The word for meat offering that he begins to talk about is the minka. We actually talked about it last week. It means a gift, a tribute, an offering, a present. 
A tribute is defined as wealth that one party gives to another as a sign of respect or submission or allegiance. It was required by the king from his subjects. And we acknowledge that he's the king. Is it any wonder that the next thing he begins to talk about is that they need to bring the minka. They went into the land and they misrepresented him. They went into the land and they compromised the house. And he's reminding that if you want to get back from this, if you still want to be in this covenant relationship, it's going to have to do with you presenting the minka. You submitting yourself to me. You respecting me in the manner that I'm supposed to be. And you offering your allegiance to the king once again. And if you're going to stay in the camp, it's required. Because the king will have his tribute. So we find that after the disaster of the spies, Yahweh reminds us that there, there's still hope. There's still a chance. And it has to do with presenting the minka offering. And it was literally inferring that Israel themselves, you're the minka. You're supposed to present all of yourself, not just a piece, not just a part. You're supposed to present all of yourself in submission and allegiance to him. And that's the proper and the only way to show respect to the king. And we find that if we've given ourselves wholly over to him, then when we face the enemy, guess what? It's not going to be an issue because we know where our help comes from. We're the minka. We've given ourselves wholly over to him, and now his name rests upon us. We don't have to be the ones that deals with him. Notice the word minka is spelled with the same letters as manuka, the resting place. He's connecting the dots for you that the way to have his name placed upon you, the way to be truly redeemed out of bondage and now be made a son or a daughter, no longer wearing the garments of a slave, would be to present yourself as a minka. When you present yourself wholly before me, when you truly submit all that you are, laying aside your own selfish desires, and you truly come before me and lay yourself at my feet as that offering, as that tribute, then and only then will you become the manuka. You'll become the resting place. And I found that as you become his resting place, then in turn, you find rest as well. And this was the lesson he was trying to teach Israel. That in the midst of everything that they would go through, when they would go into the land and they would face the giants, and it would seem as if all hope was lost, if they had presented themselves as the minka, they could rest in him because he was their resting place and they were his. And the same is true for you and I today. In the days ahead when it seems that all hope is lost and there's no light anywhere and there's no hope, if you've presented yourself as the minka, then you can rest in him. And you can be one of the individuals that Daniel talks about. They that know him are going to do exploits. Amen? Amen. Amen.